Welcome to the Bite Elect Show, the only programme which gives you all the information you need to know whether you are thinking about Bite Elect or are an existing investor and landlord. Now, this is our penultimate show, and we've covered investing in Bite Elect, finance and insurance, what to buy, the health and safety aspects. And in this programme, we are focusing more on what happens when Buy to Let doesn't go according to plan. Now, on this occasion, I've asked Paul Champlina, the founder of Landlord Action, to join me, as he is one of the UK's top experts when it comes to dealing with problems that landlords have. Paul, perhaps you can start off by explaining a little bit about how you got into this business and what you do. OK, well, firstly, uh, Kate, I got into helping landlords and dealing with problem tenants from actually the age of about 18. I worked in a law firm many moons ago, and I don't look much older now, of course. That's what you're, you're supposed to agree with me. I'm sorry, did I miss a few? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so I was helping landlords, and then I, I, I worked in the, the recession in the late 80s, dealing with and acting for the banks with mortgage repossession when the interest rates were 15 16%, Where? tough times. Yeah. And then uh, I started uh, working for myself and became a bailiff and a private investigator, but always helping landlords and tenants. So I did loads of stuff on the ground, going into shops, taking possession, serving paperwork, surveillances. You name it, I did some really quite colourful stuff, but always helped landlords dealing with problem tenants. And then in 1999, with my uh, previous partner, uh, I set up Landlord Action to help landlords before the big birth of Buy to Let, uh, because we thought lawyers were charging too much money. Okay. So we offered a fixed fee and a free advice line. And actually now we've done over 35,000 instructions uh, in 16 years since we've been going. Yeah. And that free advice line is still available? The free advice line is still available. And uh, we're now regulated firm of solicitors, which happened about three and a half years ago. Okay. So I have solicitors and paralegals issuing possession claims on behalf of landlords and letting agents. So with all that kind of vast experience in the few years that you've been doing this, since you were 18, mm. um, what would you say are the five sort of main problems that that, um, you see with tenants so for example I guess the first one is failing to reference people properly so failing to reference is a big problem uh, you have a lot of landlords that are worried about having a property empty avoid losing money wanting to stick a tenant in as quickly as possible getting part of the information you know and uh, they're not diligent enough all they're thinking about is that rent payment the month's rent month's deposit to pay that mortgage payment for the the, the smaller landlords but actually a, t a tenancy agreement a six or 12 month tenancy agreement is like a credit agreement yeah. so of course what you have to do you have to spend a lot of time at the the pre-letting stage so i say that you meet a tenant you do a viewing you actually question the tenant you find out their intentions I know landlords that have met up with uh, with tenants in their current property they're living in to find out how um, what state the property is in. So you know you have to get your three months bank statements, your previous landlords reference, your employment reference. You have to do your right to rent check now. More legislation. You need to make sure that the ID on that tenant is that ID. Uh, check to see if they've got any county court judgments. So you need to put all that in place. And if they do qualify that, then that's great. And actually. A lot of landlords don't have time to do that, so they use, need to use a, a reputable referencing agent that can do that for you. For the sake of 20, 30 pound, it's a no-brainer. One of the other things I come across a lot is um, find people moving tenants in and, and they'll swap with each other. That is quite... How do I manage that as a landlord? That's really common. I mean, we have a massive problem with subletting at the moment, which I'm sure we can talk about a little bit later on, but you rent out on a tenancy agreement to A, B and C, and then C, D and F and move in. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got to make sure that all those people that say they're in the agreement are on the agreement. Viewings is really important. So uh, the biggest problem we have with landlords is that they won't actually do regular inspections at the property to find out who's there. Having a good relationship yeah. with neighbours is really important because if you end up renting out to three people and you've got 15 people in there, you need to know about it sooner rather than later. And then now, because of the right to rent checks that came in last year, more importantly, you've got to make sure that uh, you haven't got any, obviously, illegal immigrants living in your property. OK. Can you just explain the right to rent checks a little? Yeah, so uh, when now part of your referencing procedure and of course there's a whole load of other stuff that you have to do now we're under the deregulation sure. act so more and more compliance for landlords that's why they need to should really use letting agents is that when you have a tenant who may be an overseas tenant you need to make sure they have the right to stay in this country so as a landlord or a letting agent who could still be liable uh, for a penalty is that you need to see the original documentation so it could obviously be uh, obviously their passport uh, their national ID card and actually documentation that will say that they have a right to stay in the property, whether they're a student or someone employed. Okay. And you've got to make sure you qualify that 
And actually, you need to find out when that visa runs out. So that visa could run out a year later, which could be midterm in the middle of a tenancy agreement. And if that is the case, then what you need to do is you need to contact uh, the Home Office landlord checking line to find out if that tenant still has the right to stay in the property. Okay. Record everything, it's really important, because technically, if you've got an illegal immigrant living in your property, you could be fined £3,000 per occupant. Right, okay. And I think that you have to, whoever it is, you have to do the right to check on every, everyone, don't you? That's correct, yeah, yeah. You, you have to do that. Uh, and and I, I did a little bit worry when it did come in, because I was worrying that landlords could possibly discriminate, which is the worst thing that could happen. Yeah, yeah. And the, I guess the next one, damage to the property. How do, how do you deal with that? How do you avoid it? And then how do you deal with it when it happens? What yeah, do you do? so, you know, obviously damage, malicious damage, fair wear and tear, it's all mixed up together. So obviously having malicious damage insurance is a no-brainer. Having the right landlord insurance is a, is a good preventative me measure in the sense that if you did have to claim, you're covered. But again, it comes down to the inspections, making sure that you have a robust inventory going in, making sure you do your midterm inventory checked, make sure you get access, good photographic evidence, and uh, also explaining to the tenants their responsibilities in renting. Sure. You know, uh, I, uh, you know, I've done many evictions, obviously, for the TV yeah. programmes, as you know, and you go in the property and not only is it a nightmare for a landlord because I'm to evict the tenant because of, obviously, rent arrears, but the tenants trash the property, you know, being really sure. vindictive. And that can could be costly. And that can be costly. And of course, you have a deposit that's registered in the deposit scheme and you need to try and make a claim for that. But most of the time, if it is maliciously damaged, it's not going to cover the cost. Right, OK. So that's why you've got to get the right insurance. Yeah. And what, what do you do when there's late payment of rent? How do we deal with that situation? Is it, I, I assume that actually that just can happen by accident sometimes. Well, it can, but you've got to be, it can, it, it can happen by accident, but you've got to be on top of it. So if you are managing the property yourself, mm -hmm. OK, then the rent's due on the 1st of the month. You check on the 1st of March online to see the payment's in. It's not in. We wait a couple of days because, of course, you could end up speaking to the tenant and they could say there's a banking problem, which is which most of the common excuses. And if they don't pay up, then you need to find out why. But you can't bang up the door at 10 o'clock at night and start harassing them and get landlord rage, which is what we call it, landlord action. What you need to do is you need to try and speak to the tenant. Sometimes tenants will fall on hard times. You've got to try and work with them because most landlords that are in buy to let long term, they want a tenant there as long as possible. And actually, if you work with a tenant through uh, the hour of need, you could end up on that tenant for a much longer period of time. But what you want to do is you should end up making a call to the tenant, preferably in the evening, maybe on a telephone number they don't recognise. I'll give you some tips uh, on the trade now. Oh, My bailiff good. cap's coming on. <laughs> um, and they will answer it, hopefully. Uh, they could ignore it. They could be hiding behind the sofa, the usual scenario. And then you have a series of, like, three seven-day letters. So a nicely, nicely, more stern. And actually, the last seven-day letter saying, if you do not pay me your rent within seven days, along with the next month's rent, which is due, i.e. in April, then we'll be serving a Section 8 eviction notice okay. on you. So I guess that comes on to the, to the final one, really, is if they don't pay their rent and then they don't... And they don't leave and they refuse to leave, what, what do I do? Well, what you do is you go into the last case scenario, which is you need to go to court and serve... Well, you first got to serve your notice. And once you serve the notice, you've got to make sure it's correct. You've got to make sure you've got the correct grounds on the notice. You've got to make sure it's served correctly. And if it's a rent arrears notice, it's a Section 8 notice. You've got to give the tenant at least 14 days. If you just want to end the contract, that's called a Section 21 notice, a two-month notice. And if the tenant ignores that, which a lot of tenants do, you have to go to court and issue proceedings. That could take six to eight weeks. You go to the court. You we, we have uh, advocates that stand up before the judge. And you get a possession order and you get a money order, telling the tenant to leave. And, of course, if they still don't leave, then we have to arrange to get the bailiffs in to do the eviction, which um, can take another six weeks. So you've got to think to yourself, worst case scenario, if I have a problem tenant, it could cost me four months, five months in extra lost rent and legal fees. Right, okay. How can I deal with that? How can I do I have a B plan with regard to paying out these fees and more, more importantly paying out the mortgage? And we have scenarios at Landlord Action where we have unfortunately desperate landlords that have mortgage arrears and sometimes we're speaking to the banks and building sites to try and buy them more time so that we can do the eviction and get their property back. Right, okay. And I mean that sounds like quite a complicated process to try and manage with the number of weeks, etc. If I've say we've got a family as well and this isn't my day job. Mm. Your recommendation, is this something I can do myself or should we be... I know you are one of the professionals, yeah. but 
it, it does sound hard work. Well, look, there's landlords that have evicted tenants before and know how to do it. I mean, last year there was over 131,000 possession claims that were issued in England and Wales, actually down from the previous year. But a lot of landlords get it wrong. They get the okay. paperwork wrong, they file it wrong, and they wait to go before the judge. Case dismissed, they're back to square one. So I would say use a reputable company, more importantly, a company that was regulated by the Solicitors Regulation Authority, someone right. that specialises in landlord and tenant. OK, because like it ourselves. is. <laughs> I will bear that in mind. Yeah. Well, thanks to Paul's expertise, that's given us a great quick guide to dealing with problems during a tenancy. And there will be more resources to read and watch at the end of the programme. On the Buy to Let show, we've been talking about the difficult problems that can arise, from referencing tenants to evictions. So how do you deal with tenant issues as a landlord? Rachel Hudson has run a Buy to Let business for more than 20 years. And when it comes to choosing tenants, she takes expert advice. To find tenants, I use an agency, uh, purely because they have um, everything in place um, to do the credit referencing and the, the checks that are required then they move the tenants in for me and this for me is more cost effective than me actually doing it myself and then as soon as they've moved the tenant in I take over the tenancy so I manage all the day-to-day -day running, the, if there's any queries, any problems and then at the end of the tenancy I'll actually uh, do the check out of the tenancy and then I'll hand it back to the agent to find me a new, pro new tenant. In her time as a landlord, Rachel's only had a handful of problems. In one case, she had a tenant who'd fallen behind on their rent. I had a tenant um, that was uh, two months into arrears, um, and obviously I did the normal, you know, contacted them, uh, find out to try and see if I could arrange with them that they wanted to stay. Could they afford to sort? To, could they afford to catch up with the rent in months? You know, months that are coming, um, but they openly said to me no that they weren't going to leave. Um, so I knew that for me, again, down to, to cost and it being cost effective, it was better for me to hand it to a solicitor than it was for me to actually go uh, to do it myself. I have had one case where um, a tenant has rang me up, said, Rachel, they can't, they can't afford uh, to pay the rent anymore. And I've said to them, I've tried to liaise with them um, and that they couldn't afford the rent. So we actually, I did do that with myself. They agreed to leave at the end of the month. And it, for me, it was about how I communicated with the tenant. When it comes to an eviction, Rachel turns to her legal company. The worst case that I had, um, I did actually use a legal company um, purely because um, for me, again, uh, dates of when you have to hand the documentation you have to give to tenants has to be precise if you're a day over it can get thrown out so for me again it's that area of expertise because I don't have to do rent arrears very often I always hand it over to my solicitors because they have more more ways of dealing with it than myself and um, again like rent arrears if you go through a whole legal process sometimes they can agree with the tenant that the they don't have to pay the rent arrears, but they'll leave. Um, so again, for me, it's about the cost effectiveness of it all. It doesn't have to end in legal action. Rachel's resolved other issues with a bit of sympathy. I've actually had one case, um, which you just reminded me of, where they, the tenants did ring me up. Uh, they both unfortunately lost their jobs the, the month previously. And they rang me up to say they've both found new jobs, but they didn't have any money for the rent for that month. So what we agreed was that they would actually pay an extra £50 a month for the next four or five months on top of their rent and they stayed and they paid. So for me, I never automatically think let's evict you because if they're great tenants and they've hit a bad time like we all can, it's let's see if we can help them. And that one worked out. They're still a tenant today. So the advice from this experienced landlord when it comes to dealing with problem tenants is that a bit of understanding can make all the difference. If you're reasonable with tenants, they'll be helpful. Um, they won't try and hide things from you. Um, so for me, that's, that's the advice that I would give. Speak to the tenants first, um, because it could just be that the circumstances are temporary um, and you can actually arrange something and sort something out. If not, then you do have to go the other route, which unfortunately um, isn't a nice route. It's a reminder that buy to let is complex, with landlords juggling, running a business, dealing with legal issues and providing a service to their tenants. Coming up, we'll be exploring this more with three experts from the industry.
On the Vital Let Show, we've been talking about what happens when it doesn't go to plan. Let's explore that now with Paul Champlina, founder of Landlord Action, Christina Dimitrov from Direct Line, and Steve Harriet from the Tenancy Deposit Scheme. Hi, everyone. Hi. So, my first question, Paul, you are a master at this. Do you think landlords typically reference a tenants properly, or should they be doing more? How long have we got? <laughs> uh, the problem with landlords is a lot of landlords, especially the, we say the amateur landlords, which is 90% of the landlords out there, they will rush in to elect and uh, they won't do enough diligence. Obviously, their property is their biggest investment. Absolutely. So spend a bit more time, make sure you get that gut feeling. But of course, you have that mortgage payment at the end of the month. So obviously, what we would always say is you always go for your bank statements. Three months bank statements will tell the uh, landlord how much the tenant's getting paid a month. Are they getting paid by they, the employer they say they're with? Yeah. Uh, and, and also you've said, like, mm, on the day, look mm, at the day that they're getting paid yes. so you know when to look at charging the rent as well. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah it's really important. So, so, you know, you need to know that if they do say they want a salary of 25K, what's the net figure and are they getting that salary on a standing order at the end of the month? Yeah. As well as obviously previous landlords uh, reference and obviously the employment's reference, character references, credit checking. You've got to put the little pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, OK. I think that's really helpful. Any other thoughts? Well, I mean, I suppose one thing that a lot of people do wrong is they just go online the very first tenants reference sort of check they find or a quick shortlist after body, you know, it's not that simple. You need to sit down and see the full picture. It's like, where would I start if I needed to employ somebody to do something for me? And it wants, I want this to be a long-term relationship. It's almost having this approach that helps you figuring out what are the questions you need to ask and then need to know. Okay, Steve. Well, we deal with about 1.4 million landlords, so we see okay. a huge range of experience. And I think that one of our big mantras is it's really important to get things right at the start of a tenancy because mm. that's, that stops problems at the end. Yeah. And clearly, referencing your tenant, knowing who the tenant is, knowing their history, knowing their employment background, knowing the previous tenancies they've had and what landlords have said about them is pretty key. So I think it is worth spending time on, on getting the referencing right. I think landlords will, will, will reap the rewards of that at the end. And actually, I can just tell you, only on Friday, I was filming for the TV programme Nightmare Tenant Slum Landlords, and I was filming in Halifax, and this landlord, he spent three or four months <coughs> renovating this property. And while he was renovating, this uh, tenant had come up to him while he was renovating, who lived down the street, and said, I'm looking for a place. And he thought, oh, I'll, I'll help oh, this tenant lovely. out. <laughs> Moved her in. And, of course, she's now on the programme at Nightmare Tenants Slum for land, Slum Landlords. Right. I assume not paying much rent. No, didn't pay any rent, didn't reference, and he made a mistake. So it's all about the referencing. Yeah, OK. And I guess tenancies, we have to accept tenancies are going to have, to, going to have difficulties. Um, and where, in your experience, should landlords turn to help? Steve, you, you do quite a lot with a charitable foundation. Yeah, so the TDS Charitable Foundation really exists to try to help landlords and tenants find out more about how to exercise their rights and responsibilities. So there's a huge amount of resource available online. And you need all to free. look for it. It's all free. Uh, the Landlord Association, Residential Landlords Association, for example, is a, is a great source uh, of information. Citizens Advice Bureau, uh, other organisations are out there. So I think you can find uh, stuff. It's available online. Don't be afraid to search for it and you'll find it. OK, and I think that is the point, is do search for it, Christina. Don't just do exactly what the chap did that Paul was mentioning, accept a tenant that walked in off the street. That's right, that's right. I mean, from our perspective, we're an insurer, and so we are here to help when something goes wrong in your property. And I suppose the key areas where insurance helps are, I mean, the majority of claims and problems, from our perspective, are accidental damages of smaller scale or okay. larger magnitude. Yeah. So, for example, you have a leak and you need this to be fixed, so your insurer will come and help you and cover the costs of this fix. And that's very frequent. But then there is things that are they're quite rare or less frequent, but they can be quite scary if they happen. So, for example, malicious damage by your tenants, probably also featured on your program <laughs> at some point. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, these people might have made some damage to what's inside your property, the structure of your property, they might have trashed something that's yours, and then now they're out and you need to cover for these costs. There is cover for that. There is cover for public liability if, for example, there's been a leak that's caused 
the neighboring property to carry some damages okay. to the structure. Something you might not think about. Exactly. It might be legal costs that come up to you. It might be costs of, you know, paying to your neighbors. So these are things that also are there. But then consider rental income, tenants not paying. That's something that's going wrong and that has a massive impact on you. You can insure yourself against that too. You can get insurance that covers you again for this particular need when your constant income stream has been stopped. They can even help you with the eviction process as well then, the costs of eviction, the costs of repairing, getting the property ready for the next tenant. Once um, the current tenant has been evicted. Yeah, so you can get back on track. Exactly. But one thing to keep in mind is, and just to get back to the tenants referencing bit, your insurer does check if you've done your due diligence and you, if you oh, have okay. tenants referenced and therefore have checked the risks. Okay. So it's like an extra check for you. You need to, exactly. You mm. need to do your job in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Paul? I think the biggest problem that landlords have is, is actually ignorance, is that... Uh, they, they think, I'm going to get a buyer to let, or obviously a lot of them are default landlords, but they just can't keep up with the constant legislation changes and uh, the actual time it takes to actually manage a property. They don't put a price on their time. Uh, and cheap is always expensive. I'm a, a great believer in that. And I would always say to a landlord who's embarking on the journey of being a landlord or being a landlord by default, always use a letting agent. You know, do you want to be taking calls? at three o'clock in the morning from a tenant that's lost his keys or the boiler <laughs> broken down, most landlords will say no and they'd be happy to pay the 10 or 15% mm. management fee. Yeah. It's a complete no-brainer. But important to bear in mind, um, and again, Steve, letting agents aren't regulated, are they? So th you've got to look for somebody that's a Arla Nails Ricks or UK Arla agent that Correct. voluntary. I think, I think that's right because I think those agents who have a professional body behind them, I think on the whole are delivering a better service. They're covered by codes of practice. Uh, they're, they're covered by training. So I think the, the, the people that work in letting agents can help the, uh, the inexperienced landlord to get to grips with the whole raft of legislation yeah. and regulations that, that surround yeah. letting. And of course they've got client money protection, Indeed. which is a must. Yes, you know. absolutely. So that's where if, if somebody runs off with the rent, yeah. <laughs> you still get it as a landlord. That's the yeah. important thing. I mean, a quick word about the deposit, if I might, because I think at the yeah. end of the tenancy, the deposit is potentially there to help landlords deal with things that, that go wrong. And again, another great source of advice for both tenants and landlords about the deposit is to just ring up the tenancy deposit schemes. And uh, we've got a free call centres that will give advice on those sorts of issues to, to, to landlords. Well, so even if I'm worrying about it or I'm just Correct. not, something's ha cropped yeah. up and I'm not sure yeah. if that's something I can hold Correct. Two, you know, we often get calls about, you know, can I claim for, uh, you know, a broken toilet, for example, from the deposit? And, you know, if you're, not, if you're unsure about that, just ring the schemes up. We can give advice on that. OK, so don't, don't stick your head in the sand is basically the other thing. And what sort of things can a landlord and what do they retain from a deposit perspective? Because that, that can be one of the big areas yeah. for disputes, can't it? It can. So I think the, it's important that if you're going to take a deposit, and most landlords do take a deposit to help uh, protect them, that first of all, the tenancy agreement is pretty clear about what deduct deductions you can make. So just be careful about that. Not all tenancy agreements that you can download from the internet will no. have a right deposit protection clause. So getting that right is important. OK. Um, most of the claims we get involve uh, cleaning uh, claims. They, they appear in over 50% of all of our uh, disputes. So the key thing there is to make sure that at the start of the tenancy, you've got a good inventory and a schedule of condition that really sets out uh, how clean the property is room by room uh, and the condition of any furniture or fittings in, in the property. It's worth investing in that at the beginning. Yeah. And that, that provides you the evidence you and need at to the assess end, any you need to repeat it. So at the end of the tenancy, you've got to go back in and, and assess uh, how clean the, the property is room by room, where there's been any damage caused to the property, and then that's the basis of any claim. And I think it's also important that landlords understand this concept of fair wear and tear. Clearly, uh, yes. if you've had a carpet that's been down for 10 years and it gets a bit damaged at the end of that 10 years, you can't really claim for a brand new carpet. So, yeah. betterment. And yeah. betterment. And betterment. It's yeah. called fair for a reason, yes, basically. Yes, it is. And I think that is that is also quite important because uh, clearly over time, furniture and fittings do deteriorate mm. and it's only reasonable that the landlord gets some recompense if they're damaged, but you won't get back the full uh, cost of renewal okay. that you would have paid at the beginning. That's great. Thank mm. you so much. So that's it from the Buy to Let show. Thanks to my guests. Hope you found that useful. Don't forget, you can see all of our programmes online. See you next time and bye for now. Here on the Buy to Let show, we aim to bring you all the information you need to run a successful Buy to Let. 
You can find more advice and help by following these links. And you can download our special ebook, which goes with the programme.